This right here is the KSO Show. Stay current on everything in the world of K-State basketball and K-State football. We cover everything going inside the two programs. If you want inside information, subscribe to K-State Online and join a message board with fans just like yourself. Now, let's get it. You're listening to the KSO Show. I'm Derek Young, joined by Grant Flanders. This is the edition following the 12th consecutive basketball loss of, of the season. I think that brings them to uh, is it overall five and seventeen mm-hmm. five and seventeen overall one and twelve in the Big Twelve, all eleven of those par- part of the twelve game winning st- or losing streak. Uh, the a loss to Texas A and M being the other. Today it was to Oklahoma State, so they've been swept by the Cowboys this year, and um, kept it closer than the last time. The first time Cade Cunningham, uh, oh no, Cade Cunningham did play the first time. It was, I think, Nig- was Nigel Pack that didn't? Um, they were thought Nigel Pack and Antonio Gordon yeah. that game. Yeah, so th- they were shorthanded, the lost by much more than they did on Saturday, I guess we should call it, since uh, you could be listening to this on a different day. And today they lost, or Saturday they lost 67-60 to Oklahoma State, played them cl- tougher, tighter than the first time, the first um, the the last times when they were without Nigel Pack with COVID, Oklahoma State was under shorthanded a little bit in the first game as well, but not a, as big of a disaster. And today they had they were the ones without a player. They were without well, with, both both without good players. Dejuan Gordon for K State, and then yeah. Isaac Likely, obviously huge piece for Oklahoma State, and I think was definitely part of the reason K State could keep it close with other other reasons as well near the end of the game, but. It was that first half that was historically bad for the Wildcats. Yeah, another another historically <laughs> historical yeah. negative for this season. They did uh, kind of tighten it up a little bit in mm-hmm. in the second half once they fell. I think at one point they were down by twenty or close to. Yep, it. twenty, and then they went and, on a yeah, then on a, a sixteen zero run. run um, probably the best little stretch of basketball maybe for the Kansas State so far this season. Uh, still find a way to lose by seven points, and it's probably. Even though they should maybe feel better about themselves a little bit in terms of that they were a tad more competitive than they were the last time against Oklahoma State. But that seven-point win, I guess I would also say, is a little misleading as well. Or a seven-point loss, I should say. A little misleading because they were, they were trailing by double digits for most of the day. Yep, absolutely. Coach Weber said after the game, and Antonio Gordon said this before even Coach Weber came on, that Thursday and Friday, both practices were really bad for K-State. Energy was not there. Emotion was not there. Um, so I can imagine. And I, I have no reason – there's really no reason why it shouldn't be there. You think after two games of playing better against Texas and Tech that uh, they would try to you know, carry that on into some really good practices going into a tough matchup with Oklahoma State, but they didn't apparently. Bad couple of practices, and uh, but it's still you know no excuse, but it carried into an awful, awful first half offensively coming off the best offensive game of the year for K-State against Texas and was the reason they were able to stay in it against Texas and only lose by four um, because Texas was having a great offensive game as well. But this is a scenario where both teams really struggled offensively. Even Oklahoma State didn't perform that well offensively, even in the first half, but they still went up by 16 going into halftime. But K-State showed some fight in the end and were only able to you know keep within single digits, which which is sad to say this out loud, you know, or on the message board, like I said, after the game. It's sad that this is the case, but these are some of the the small, quote-unquote, wins you could take from this for the Wildcats, single-digit losses, because there was a stretch there uh, where they were losing, I think it was four straight games by 20-plus points, and then uh, an even longer streak of just uh, double-digit losses in a row until that was finally... Uh, stunted when they beat Texas last week because even in the two games prior to this against Texas Tech that they played better and they still lost by 11 points so losing by four points and then seven points there's still a little consolation there but still it's 12 12 losses in a row things are still not going great for this program yeah I mean we're not saying that those things like oh well, at least they kept it within single digits so I mean, we obviously know yeah, that's still, not, that's it's an awful thing yeah, actually that we have to say yeah, that that we get to say that yeah we know that it's not uh, a good thing you know or and and it's obvious obviously that 
we're not trying to excuse this year, but yeah, when they, you'd still have to apply perspective to situations and we still have to keep reporting on yeah. it. And, you know, suffice it to say, it's not a good thing, but, you know, keeping it within single digits is an improvement and it has to be pointed out. It doesn't need, it's not us defending uh, the direction yeah. of, of where things are headed or, or excusing being one in 12, but you do have to change the par a little bit for this team because of all the struggles they did have. I mean, this is the same team that lost to Baylor by 48, lost a home to Fort Hayes State by 13, exactly. yeah, obliterated by Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. um, this looks a lot better than those, that's yeah, for sure. So, so <laughs> the, the, they're, at some point, you have to say, hey, a seven point loss to <laughs> Oklahoma State is progress. So the last time they got obliterated by Oklahoma State, even though they were without Nigel Pack and Obviously, he showed again on Saturday that he's probably, not probably, he is the best player on this team. He is. Um, offensively, his presence is undeniable. He, he can get it done facilitating the ball, but his best attribute has been shooting the ball. Um, mostly, you know, finding himself open, whether it's off the ball or even pulling up into a triple uh, with the ball in his hands. But the fact is, he can't do it on his own. There's no one else really shooting at the clip he's shooting at, and it makes it that much tougher because... People can suffocate them because um, that's one thing that not having Dejuan Gordon hurts, but uh, that's one thing Dejuan Gordon wouldn't even help with if he was back and healthy on this team is opening up the floor for anyone else because no one else besides Pac can shoot at a high clip. Today, Celta Miguel, another freshman, went 0 of 7 from the field, just got awful. Um, yeah, not, yeah, not a lot of shooters on the, on this team. Um, and it is what it is. They, they recruited the lineup that they have, the roster that they have. I think Kasupki's going to be a good shooter at some point. Um, just, you know, he's kind of swimming in pretty fast waters right now. Still a little it, timid. Only took one shot yep, against Oklahoma so State. Yeah, he, so he's still swimming in some pretty brutal waters right now. And then besides Nigel Pack, there's literally no one else that is a reliable shooter. I mean, Dejuan Gordon's not a very good shooter. Nope, Celta, why, yeah. Celta Miguel can't hasn't shot it at all well the girl's this year been inefficient and i don't know but i mean before these last few games i could have said we could have said you know when's the last time we saw a considerable perimeter bucket knocked down by either one of antonio gordon mike mcgirl or Celton miguel now and this will transfer into our next point we probably should um address that's changed a little bit from antonio gordon the last few games still not shooting great and that yep. That, that, will part, never that part of that that part hasn't <laughs> come along like they they thought it would when they recruited him. That that part just hasn't come along. But as bad as he was playing for the entirety of the season, the last three games have been better from him. Absolutely, uh, that's one thing that without the other Gordon, um, he's been able to step up because without that other Gordon, uh, Dejuan Gordon, that's their glue guy. Uh, once he got hurt, someone had to step up and be the energy guy out there. And for some reason. Noah Dejuan, but you insert Antonio. They actually, those is that's when games start to start looking even a little better for K State. Um, outside of the KU game, that was the first game without Dejuan Gordon for a full 40 minutes, and uh, you know they lost that one pretty bad. But after that, Antonio Gordon uh, has been very selective, very smart with when he shoots the ball, not not forcing anything like we saw even as early as against KU was he had one of those awful drive the length of the, the floor with the ball in his hands and do a fadeaway against McCormick. That didn't work out. He's been better these last three games. Yep, still not shooting well, but the energy's there. He's rebounding at a, uh, an incredible rate. And he probably had his, if it's not his best game, because his best game might be that uh, scoring output he get, put up against Baylor in the first game, but that was non-competitive. He had 23 points or something like that. This game, he had 15 points, 14 rebounds. So this might be the best game of his uh, season, of his career. Uh, first double-double of his career. Um, and one of his, I mean, one of three of his points are from garbage time because he did have a, hit one of, one of his triples uh, from a wide-open corner three in garbage time. But the fact is, Antonio Gordon has helped. And it's not a great sign. You'd rather Mike McGurl, Nigel Pack, Davion Bradford, anyone else be the player of the game uh, against a team like Oklahoma State but the fact is uh, Antonio Gordon was the player of the game for K-State. Is there any particular reason why uh, Cade Cunningham struggled against K-State this year? <laughs> it is weird you know first game he had five points and uh, that's it and that's the only single digit game he's had of his his young career so far Oklahoma State um, 
I don't know what it is because K-State's defense has not been a regular Bruce Weber defense all season long. These guys have struggled really bad on that end. And a few weeks ago when they did play Oklahoma State and lost by 16, that was a struggle bus defense for them too. But Cade Cunningham was not the one to beat them. Isaac Likely was huge. And even in this game without Isaac Likely, Cunningham had to step up. He had 15 points. But yeah, he still struggled from the field shooting, especially in the first half. Um, I, I don't really have a good answer to why, because like I said, K-State's not been very good on defense. I'd probably have to go back and rewatch both those games to really figure out maybe what it was that, you know, if, if, if K-State really was zeroing in on Cunningham. But the fact is Oklahoma State has too many good players, too many shooters around Cunningham to ever zero in on him and think you're going to win. That's true. Now we can transition a little bit to the Big 12 to finish up uh, this you know KSO show another which will be all predominantly and all dominantly basketball discussion no not much football to talk about this time around but there will be in the next one I I'm hoping and, and we could probably start some spring preview stuff when we get there as well to finish up with this basketball KSO show all basketball we're, we're trying to hope to keep this around 20 minutes talk about the big 12 Baylor still leading the league but they've been on a COVID pause for quite some time. I think they still have their next two games are still postponed. I'm not sure they're going to be back in action until February 20th. Would you share some? Would you have any concerns about um, Baylor's form now being off for so long? Uh yeah, that is that is a little concerning because yeah, they've been off one, two, three, four, five. That's going to be five in a row. Yeah, their next two games. Which is wild. They were supposed to be two back-to-back games with West Virginia, yeah, both, both the, postponed. Yep. Um, they're not. Their next game is not scheduled till uh, next weekend against Oklahoma State. It looks like in seven days. So yeah, that's very interesting for Baylor. I still think you know they are. They deserve to be where they're at, number two in the country. They haven't shown any reason not to. They haven't lost a game. Um, but it is a little weird that they're on this this roll because they they've had COVID issues prior to this too earlier in the year. So it's interesting they're on two stints and this stint is especially long and it's going to make things very interesting and maybe concerning for them when they have to play a bunch of these teams loaded in on the back end when they should be focusing on getting ready for a Big 12 tournament and an NCAA tournament run. Yeah, and you have to wonder how many games they're going to be expected to reschedule and how many times they're going to have to play three games in a week because I think some teams are having to do that here and there. Um, just based off reschedules, um, I think that's why Kansas asked K State to push the game to Wednesday, as was pointed out on our on our board uh, by KSU Freak. Mm-hmm. And we're assuming it's probably the case. It, de- it definitely checks out. So, so my next question would be this: When it comes to the Big Twelve, who you, you have a bunch of teams jumbled up after Baylor? You have KU still. Mm-hmm. You have Texas Tech. You have Oklahoma. You have Oklahoma State. And Texas is still and, there too. and Texas is still there as well. Even though they're West going, Virginia, they're going in Texas. Yeah, Texas. <laughs> There's a bunch of yeah, schools that yeah, top seven yeah. or six. Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Tech, West Virginia, KU. Um, I think uh, Oklahoma, Baylor. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. there, there's five or six teams that are right there jumbled up that are pretty similar in resume and almost similar in conference record. Texas mm-hmm. going through some real struggles right now. Oklahoma State's kind of just. Uh, you know, every other game playing 500 ball the last few weeks. Yep. Tech and Oklahoma appear to be getting stronger. West Virginia on Saturday had a had a pretty disappointing overtime loss at, at home against yep. – uh, who was that against? Uh, uh, Oklahoma. Yeah, Oklahoma. Wait, in double overtime? Yeah. Yep, Oklahoma, West Virginia. That was yeah. a great game. But yeah. Oklahoma so was the better team. So another good win for the Sooners. So anyway, out of that jumble of teams, who do you think is the second best Big 12 team right now? Who would you go with? I will say mine. Yeah, go ahead. And 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 I know Tech beat them, but we saw what they did again on the road today. Oklahoma has some really has some of the best wins in this conference so far. I think I lean towards Oklahoma with Texas Tech a close third because Texas has fallen off to me below those teams just the way that they've played since they've returned mm-hmm. from the COVID pause. KU has shown no consistency and, and no really elite play. And then I guess the other one would be Oklahoma State, and they've just been average to above average the last few weeks. So if you ask me to take it a second best, I'm probably going with Oklahoma, but I think it's close, But and I think it's between them and Texas Tech. You're exactly right. I wouldn't change that in the least. I think both teams are really good. 
Um, both teams have really good guards, and that's really important. And Oklahoma has the added Brady Manick, who's been around in a really good stretch four. I didn't envision Austin Reeves being this good for them. No, I didn't. I think I think it's pretty clear that those. I mean, Baylor's obviously top 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 echelon. Yeah, there's like tiers. The yep. first tier is Baylor by and, themselves, and then you might have Oklahoma and Tech by themselves. Yeah, the number then two. second and tier is yeah. Sooners and Red Raiders by themselves. And then I would and have Texas, West Virginia, that and Oklahoma tier. State lumped together. I would have Texas and West Virginia lumped together. Oh, you think Oklahoma State's even a notch under that? No, I have Texas and West Virginia in that third tier. Then I put Oklahoma State and KU below them. I have Interesting. O- I have Oklahoma State with KU. I have Oklahoma State with uh, Texas and West Virginia in that third tier. I would have KU closer. That's the thing. They might be in a tier of their own because they're still probably going to make the tournament. But See, I, th- I, I think West Virginia and um, Texas are in that tier by themselves. And I think KU and Oklahoma State are much more similar because they're kind of doing what they should but not doing anything out of the ordinary either. I think KU's doing below expectations. Oklahoma State is kind of... I mean, they they took care. Of, they, could, they took care of TCU and K State. So I guess K, Kansas is doing what they should. Is what I'm saying. Because because well, compa- there's four teams or there's like three teams in this league. You have to be TCU, K State, and Iowa State. And KU has just went through that and done. No doubt. They beat. Um, they swept Iowa State. That that they're about to sweep K State. They beat. They beat TCU a couple weeks ago. They're doing what they should be doing as well. And Oklahoma State is. Yeah, too. and Oklahoma State is too. Um, then they, they just beat TCU or they won. Actually, upset. TCU was one that TCU did TCU beat upset, upset Oklahoma State. So that. that's why Oklahoma State, I think, comes down to the KU level because you're losing to TCU. Okay, I, that's, a, that's a fair point. And I think I think your money with that. Um, and, and, and head-to-head, and, they've split. So yeah, I mean, yeah, so I think Oklahoma State and Kansas are pretty similar. And, and you have to remember, too. And that's in we, fourth we, tier, yeah, though, too, yeah, which is yeah. and we, way and, down the line. Yeah, and we just watched... Oklahoma State play Kansas State, and we weren't really wild. So I think Oklahoma State and KU are very, very similar. They both played K State similarly. the The fact is, Oklahoma State didn't close. KU closed. They were both nursing twelve to fourteen point leads for most of the game. Yep, absolutely. And uh, I mean, I would say I, back to Texas Tech and Oklahoma. I think those are the best teams in the league. Besides Baylor, I think yep. all three have really good chances when it comes to tournament chances at the end of the year. Uh, to go deep because guard play is the most important thing. Mac McClung's the real deal. Um, and that's what makes Oklahoma State interesting is this is a very new team as well. Uh, coming into this year, a lot of new guys for this team, but they're still playing well. In tournament time, if Cade Cunningham could turn it on, likely those are two really good guards that could be interesting come postseason time. But as far as regular season is gone, I would agree that they're similar to Kansas. But postseason-wise... Oklahoma State has the guards to get it done, whereas Kansas, I don't really believe in their guards really at all, no. besides Braun, maybe. Brown, yeah. Yeah, Brown. They're, no, they don't have the guard play because Marcus Garrett's having to be the lead guard, so that kind of tells you everything you need to know. What I will say about Kansas is they continue to struggle real bad on the offensive side of the, of the floor. I get that. But their defense is starting to clamp. Well, lately, the last few games, their defense, Don't say that on here. their defense is coming together, and, and I hate it. we'll probably see that um, in Manhattan on Wednesday because uh, that's Kansas State's next game. Is yeah, Wednesday. It was interesting. You got pushed back from Tuesday to Wednesday um, because it sounds like KU wanted it that way. They asked Kansas State if that's okay. K State is probably excited about that, so they can try to you know get some good practices going since they had a couple of bad ones. Uh, but it should be, yeah, that's the thing. It's another one of those things. I wouldn't be surprised if K-State gets manhandled on Wednesday. I wouldn't be surprised if they play them close. Um, one thing I know that's not going to happen is K-State blowing them out by any means. Um, but I'd be surprised about any other any other result. K-State blowout, or I'm sorry, yeah, Kansas blowout, K-State barely winning. Um, that's probably the most unlikely one out of all the, the possibilities <laughs> Because that's the thing is they haven't been able to show that they can beat anyone besides uh, Iowa State and Ames, and that was in 2020. So, yeah. Well, <laughs> they'll, we'll, they'll, we'll have another KSO show in between now and the Sunflower Showdown um, in Manhattan. So we'll touch more on that game at that time, yeah. and hope you'll be back here for it when we do. But for now, I'm Dy, and I'm with Flando. And what do we? Tell your friends and let us get out of here. Okay.